Good morning, everyone. Hey, if you're not in a seat yet, come on in and grab a seat. We have some that are available. I welcome you all to this gathering of Anchor Baptist Church. Today is Sunday, March 19th, 2023. And so this is our second ever gathering in this place. For some, I suppose it is still your first who weren't able to be with us here last Sunday, but last Sunday was uh, a glorious day, uh, at least from my perspective, I thought it was. And I look forward to many uh, more such gatherings here with you, my church family, over the years to come. Uh, I also think I see some new faces here this morning, and so a special welcome to you if this is your first time gathering with us. We're glad to have you here with us. Uh, we are gathered now for our regular time of worship, and this will be followed by a time of informal fellowship. And this evening, our small groups plan to meet, and we meet in various member homes. Uh, we will be looking at and discussing lesson number three uh, in the book, Reaching the Lost Evangelism. So the Lord has said, I am your salvation, and we as believers are to exult in that salvation. And part of that exaltation includes uh, telling of the good news of salvation to those who do not yet believe. For we too were once lost and in need of someone to tell us the good news of the gospel. So I hope you're engaging in this study with your small group and enjoying it. Uh, a few calendar announcements. Uh, on Tuesday of this week, uh, our ladies' Bible study uh, will meet. The options are to meet either at 10 a.m. or 6.30 p.m. Uh, both of those groups will meet uh, at Leota Whiting's house. On Wednesday, we will have the return of our midweek gatherings, so meeting here at 645. We will have our Kids for Truth Club, our student ministries, and we will have the return of our adult Bible study and prayer time. So each of these groups will meet for one hour, and I hope to see every one of you here showing up for this gathering of our church family. Uh, this Saturday is the bridal shower for Nina Boonkong. So that will meet here uh, at 6 p.m., and all the ladies of Anchor Baptist Church are invited. Next Sunday, uh, March 26th, uh, you can anticipate enjoying refreshments during our fellowship time. We will make a return to adding refreshments in to that uh, time slot, so donuts will be provided. Uh, please be appropriately considerate of our facility as you enjoy your food and drink and perhaps help others be uh, appropriately considerate as well for all of us together uh, can be good stewards of this new space. And then in a couple of weeks, thinking about Saturday, April 1st, we will be hosting a uh, public open house for those in the surrounding community. So please be in prayer for those who may come and visit and feel free to invite any friends or family or neighbors or coworkers or whoever uh, that might be interested in coming to see our new space or to meet our church family. Uh, that open house will run from three to five p.m. on Saturday, April 1st. And then the following day, Sunday, April 2nd, will be our official public launch Sunday. And so again, feel free to invite whoever you may know to come on that day as well. And so with that, can I encourage you to be prayerful, to be intentional, to be aware as we will have visitors over the coming weeks and months and even beyond. For God can and he will and he wants to use each and every one of us in the ministry of making and maturing disciples of Jesus Christ. So I hope you are as excited as I am to see what God will do in and through the people of Anchor Baptist Church, all for his glory. So uh, let's now open up our Bibles and look to the book of Psalms. I diverted last week, so we will return to our sequential uh, order of reading through the Psalms. So that puts us this week in Psalm 35. If you're using one of the Bibles that have been provided, you can turn to page 464. So Psalm 35, Pew Bible, page 464. So many of David's Psalms uh, address his experience with adversity and adversaries, and so Psalm 35 is, is no different. 
And we too, uh, at least feels like we are constantly confronted with uh, various adversities and adversaries, uh, but it is not uh, the goal to necessarily avoid or escape such circumstances, but instead to be faithful through them, trusting the Lord for wisdom and faith. And I think it is a good reminder that we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the evil spiritual forces in the heavenly places. So follow along as I read a portion of Psalm 35 here for us this morning, starting in verse 1. Contend, O Lord, with those who contend with me. Fight against those who fight against me. Take hold of shield and buckler and rise up for my help. Draw the spear and javelin against my pursuers. Say to my soul, I am your salvation. Let them be put to shame and dishonor who seek after my life. Let them be turned back and disappointed who devise evil against me. Let them be like chaff before the wind with the angel of the Lord driving them away. Let their way be dark and slippery with the angel of the Lord pursuing them. For without cause they hid their net for me. Without cause they dug a pit for my life. Let destruction come upon him when he does not know it. And let the net that he hid ensnare him. Let him fall into it to his destruction. Then my soul will rejoice in the Lord, exulting in his salvation. All my bones shall say, O Lord, who is like you, delivering the poor? For <clears throat> from him who is too strong for him, the poor and needy from him who robs him. And then jump over to verse 22. You have seen, O Lord, do not be silent. O Lord, be not far from me. Awake and rouse yourself for my vindication, for my cause, my God and my Lord. Vindicate me, O Lord, my God, according to your righteousness, and let them not rejoice over me. Let them not say in their hearts, aha, our heart's desire. Let them not say, we have swallowed him up. Let them be put to shame and disappointed altogether who rejoice at my calamity. Let them be clothed with shame and dishonor who magnify themselves against me. Let those who delight in my righteousness shout for joy and be glad and say evermore, great is the Lord who delights in the welfare of his servant. Then my tongue shall tell of your righteousness and of your praise all the day long. Let's pray. Lord God, you are the God of our salvation. There is nowhere else we could turn for salvation but to you alone, and you have done it all for us. You have loved us and you have planned for our salvation, our redemption before the beginning of time. And God, you have accomplished this through your son, Jesus Christ, who you sent into this world to take on human flesh and to die on the cross, bearing the full penalty for our sin, for my sin, uh, gladly taking it upon himself, Lord, to turn away your wrath that is justly due against our sin, Lord, and to bring us back into right relationship with you, to offer us forgiveness of sins and eternal life with you forever. God, we are here to exult in our salvation, to rejoice in it, to say, Lord, that you are great and we delight in you. We delight in the welfare that you have for us as your servants. God, I pray that we would be faithful servants of Jesus Christ here as Anchor Baptist Church, that we would be faithful servants, faithful stewards, even of this new space that we have, Lord, that we would continue to be about the making and maturing of disciples, that we would continue to not only preach the gospel to those who have not yet heard it or accepted it or received it for themselves, Lord, but to continue to preach the gospel to one another and even to ourselves uh, daily, Lord, for we need the gospel uh, above anything else. Lord, we still remain in sin and we fight against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenlies, Lord. Uh, it is not against our flesh and blood that we fight, but Lord, uh, we have your word and we have your spirit and we have one another, Lord, to persevere, to faithfully go through many trials, adversities, and, and as we confront different adversaries in this world. Lord, uh, may we be encouraged from the preaching of your word today. I pray for pastor as he would bring it to us. I thank you for his faithful study in the word his desire to bring it to us, his faithfulness in doing so, Lord, that we may be filled, uh, Lord, and that you would be praised in our doing. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
please stand as we lift our voices together this morning.
Good morning. If you would turn in your copy of scripture to Matthew 10, Matthew chapter 10, uh, if you are taking or reading from the Pew Bible, it is on page, uh, page 814, 814. We will start in verse one and read the whole entire chapter. So Matthew chapter 10, starting verse one. And he called to him his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every disease and every affliction. The names of the 12 apostles are these. First, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent out, instructing them, Go nowhere among the Gentiles, and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and proclaim as you go, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse lepers, cast out demons. You received without paying, give without pay. Acquire no gold or silver or copper for your belts, no bag for your journey, or two tunics or sandals or staff, for the laborer deserves his food. In whatever town or village you enter, find out who is worthy in it and stay there until you depart. As you enter the house, greet it. And if the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. And if anyone will not receive you or listen to your words, shake off the dust from your feet when you leave that house or town. Truly, I say to you, it will be more bearable on that day of judgment for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah than for that town. Behold, I am sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves, so be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Beware of men, for they will deliver you over to courts and flog you in their synagogues, and you will be dragged before governors and kings for my sake, to bear witness before them and the Gentiles. When they deliver you over, do not be anxious how you are to speak or what you are to say, for what you are to say will be given to you in that hour. For it is not you who speak, but the spirit of your father speaking through you. Brother will deliver brother over to death, and father his child, and children will rise against parents and have them put to death. And you will be hated by all for my namesake, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. When they persecute you in one town, flee to the next, for truly I say to you, you will not have gone through all towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. A disciple is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is enough for the disciple to be like his teacher and the servant like his master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebul, how much more will they malign those of his household? So have no fear of them, for nothing is covered that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. What I tell you in the dark, say in the light, and what you hear whispered, proclaim on the housetops. And do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Are not one of them, and not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father? But even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, you are more valuable than many sparrows. So everyone who acknowledges me before men, I will acknowledge before my father who is in heaven. But... Whoever denies me before men, I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a person's enemies will be of those his own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Whoever receives you receives me. And whoever receives me receives him who sent me. The one who receives a prophet because he is a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. 
and the one who receives a righteous person, because he is a righteous person, will receive a righteous person's reward. And whoever gives one of these little ones even a cup of cold water, because he is a disciple, truly I say to you, he will by no means lose his reward. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Please stand once more before the message this morning. Let's sing, Arise, My Soul, Arise. Arise, my soul, arise, shake off. Him and pardon me to look on him and pardon. 
Good morning. Take your Bibles, if you will, open to the book of Psalms again. We're going to pick up where I left off several weeks ago, beginning our time in the Word with a selection from the book of Psalms that particularly relate to the Word of God in our reception of the Word of God. So Psalm 119 is where we're at this morning. Psalm 119, I will read verses 9 through 16, and you follow along in your own copy of God's Word. Psalm 119, starting in verse 9. How can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. With my whole heart I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord, teach me your statutes. With my lips I declare all the rules of your mouth. In the way of your testimonies I delight as much as in all riches. I will meditate on your precepts and fix my eyes on your ways. I will delight in your statutes. I will not forget your word. Is that true of you today? I trust it is. Father, thank you so much for your word. I pray, Lord, that you would work in each one of our hearts, our lives, our thinking processes, our, the way we live, that we would be able to not only say, God, make this true of me, but it is true of me that I delight in your word even more than riches. God, we do pursue many things in life, and many of the pursuits that we do have are not bad pursuits, but when they are ultimate pursuits and they take over what ought to be there, Father, then they are bad, then they are wrong. So Lord, I pray that you would work in our lives so that your word takes priority. So your word which draws us to understand our great God understands how to live in this life. Father, thank you even as over the last several weeks, months that we have been looking at the book of Genesis, we understand the foundation of all things. You are the creator of all things. You've made me, you've made us. And Father, I pray that this would not simply be, yeah, we know this, but this would truly function as the foundation for how we view, how we treat all other human beings, the way we handle life. God, may your word truly be the foundation of the way we exist, and it won't come, it won't happen unless we give ourselves to your word. So make that true in my life and make it true in the lives of those who are here before me. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Now jump over to the book of Genesis. If you're visiting with us today, we have been in a sermon series through the book of Genesis, and we're not out of chapter one just yet. We have been in it several weeks, and Lord willing, today we will finish chapter one and then jump into chapter two next Sunday. That's the plan. I remember when I was young, I think I was probably about seven years old, that's about what I can remember. Seven years old, I was lying awake at night, and I was thinking about questions like this. Now get, I was seven years old, right? This could be a part of my weirdness. As a seven-year-old, I was asking myself these questions. Who am I? What does it mean to be me? Is it possible to even not have self-awareness and still exist? At seven years old, I was asking those questions, laying in bed at, laying in bed at night, awake, thinking. Now granted, this came from the same kid who about that same time in my life wanted to stay up all night long just to see what it was like. So I literally did that. One night, I just sat up in bed, stayed right in my bed and stayed awake all night long just to see what it was like. Counted the cars going past her house, listened to all of the commotion going on. Yeah, what a nutball I am, right? I didn't get out of bed at all. I just stayed in bed. So as you think about these sorts of questions, these are what philosophers call the big questions, and they truly are the big questions. 
whether you are seven, any seven-year-olds right, right now? Seven-year-olds? Eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14? We're gonna stop, we're gonna stop, Ben and Joe at the same time. Do you ask yourself these questions? These are the big questions of life. Do you ask yourself these questions? Believe it or not, whether people realize it, everybody is working through essentially these questions every single day. A lot of what goes on in our world right now really comes down to these questions. Who am I? What does it mean to be me? Is it, is it possible to abandon self-awareness? Now granted, some people, especially in junior high, need a little bit more self-awareness, but we won't talk about that right now, right? Is it possible to not know I'm me? And to think about all of these things, it's really self-evident as we think about the big questions of life. At some point or another, likely we feel our own relative insignificance. How many of you have gone to either the Grand Canyon or been outside on a beautifully starry night and you can see millions of stars, though you can't count millions of stars, and you feel something of your own relative insignificance? I am dinky. I am puny. And yet, probably simultaneously, you have that feeling while at the same time you're like, well, I've got to matter somehow. I've got to have some significance. I want some significance. We as believers, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, we know the answers to these dilemmas. And it's not because we fashioned them on our own. We didn't come up with them on our own. They're not human constructs. God has told us in his word. He has given us his word, the truth. Who are you? Are you something? Can you even know? Does it even matter? As I've alluded to at different points, these sorts of questions are near the center of all sorts of pursuits by humans in human society right now. The Bible, because it is not only true, but is the truth, right? That's a very important distinction to make. It is true. Everything it says is true, but it is also the truth, the standard by which we hold everything to, right? Keep that in mind. The Bible, because it is not only true, but is the truth, is the final authority on such big questions of existence. And as we're seeing in our present sermon series, Genesis is both the place to start, and it also provides the foundation for right thinking about such big questions. So, right thinking regarding who I am. Do you wanna know who you are? Well, just look in a mirror. No, that's not how you know who you are. You look in the mirror of God's word, then you will find out who you are. You could look in the mirror and see what you look like, but you're not gonna find out who you are by looking in the mirror. Big questions like who I am in relation to God. The Bible is what you need to understand that. Who I am in relation to all other humans and who I am in relation to all other living creatures. It, the Bible is the foundation for rightly understanding all of those things. So thus far, what we, conclude, what we can conclude so far regarding who I am, I am a created being, thus I am not God. That is an important distinction to make. The two statements are true together. I am a created being and therefore I am not God or a God. Second, I am human, thus I am not an animal. Another careful distinction to make. This is what God's word says. Third, I am either male or female. Thus, I am not self-determining. Caught you on that one, didn't I, right? Because you are either male or female, and that is who you are by God's created design, therefore, you don't determine who you are. Well, hold on just a second. I don't like the sound of all of that. You know what God would say to that? Tough. That's what I made you. I made you who you are. Deal with it. Ugh, I don't want to deal with it. Everybody else has been dealing with it all my life. Yeah. God's word is what you need to deal with it properly. It really is. So you can see the diagram. I had to do another diagram here. And you can see the diagram, I think, helpfully depicts the balance that is true about human beings. So humans are not gods, and yet we are uniquely connected to God in a way that nothing else is. And so you have the arrow coming back to man, 
But we are like God, being made by God in his image. Hold those two truths together in balance. Similarly, on the other side, humans are not animals. We are not. We are not mammals. We are not animals. We are not the animals at all. And yet, the arrow coming back, we are like animals, being made by God as living creatures. So in the same fact that God made us like he made the animals. So these are very significant truths to hold, and they form the foundation of understanding myself and my relationship to the world. Remember, the most succinct truth regarding humanity's fundamental distinction as humans is that we have been made by God in his image. We are made uniquely in reference to him. So, a couple of summary statements. As a result, we resemble him and we are to represent him or reflect him. We resemble God and we are to reflect him and thus we represent him to those around, it, around us and we relate to him and other things or other beings made in his image. This is foundational, which means it doesn't cover the entire landscape of what it means to be human. Certainly if you only had the book of Genesis, you would be missing the other 65 books of the Bible. That's what that means, right? And in the other 65 books of the Bible, you have a full picture of what it means to be human, especially a human who is now a sinner who needs redemption in Jesus Christ. But with Genesis, and especially Genesis 1 and 2, you have the foundation for all of that. So that's what we're saying when we're talking about the foundation. It provides the basis upon which everything else is built, which forms our foundation again for how we view or see and treat ourselves in all other human beings. So here's a little experiment. Okay, work it out like this. Look around the room right now, no joke. Actually, look around the room. Look next to you, either side of you. If you can, peer behind you without straining your neck, right? Who is different from you? Different age, different capabilities, different gender, different physical features, different personality, different developmental stages, right? Did you already start seeing some differences out there? So here's the experiment. You have some blanks on your sermon handout. Actually write something down, and I will tell you what to write down. The first blank is a person's name who is around you in this room who is different from you. Write that person's name down right now. It can be their first name, that's fine. It could be Bob. It could be, not Larry, but it can be something else that's actually present in this room right now. If your name is Larry, then it could be Larry. That's fine, right? So in the first blank, put somebody else's name in this room that is different from you. Second blank, put their difference there in that blank, okay? Third blank, write that same person's first name. And then fourth blank, write that same person's name again. So it should be something like this. Though person's name is different from me in their person's differentness, because person's name is a human and therefore is made in the image of God like me, then I should treat person's name as God intends for me to treat someone who is made in his likeness. Does that make sense? Now, this is a somewhat silly little experiment, but it actually personalizes what we're talking about here. In this room, I don't know how many people we have, but let's just say roughly 100, 115, whatever, okay? We have a range of 115 different realms of differences, right? What does it mean to look at those differences rightly? Every single one of you have been challenged before not to treat somebody that is different from you in a way that is wrong. You've been challenged by that. Some today continually are pressed with that, right? I'm not saying that this is always the case, and I don't want to always hamper or, or get on the, the backs of junior hires, but junior hires are learning themselves, and they're so, therefore learning how to deal with other people who are learning themselves too. So junior hires can be like prime opportunity for not treating others as they ought to be treated, right? Those especially who are a little bit different than you. I remember when I was working at the bank, one of the customers that was a part of our bank, he was a organic chicken farmer. And I was chatting with him one day and I said, oh, baby chicks, aren't they so cute? He's like, no, they are not. 
He said, you want to know what baby chicks do? They see different in some other chick, and they all gang up on that chick, and they peck it to death and eat it. <laughs> Here's your baby chick back, right? And guess what? I've heard that sort of story time and time again, right? That's what junior hires are like sometimes. <laughs> they see difference, no matter if it's a good difference or not, and they peck at it constantly. Now, expand that just a little bit more. What if the junior high spirit doesn't stay in junior high? What if it doesn't grow up? Then you have churches full of the junior high spirit. Can I say shame on you? Can I say that? Shame on us if that's the case. But guess what? What's going to correct that is a biblical worldview. What's going to correct that is viewing everybody through the lens of Scripture. And yet in our normal day-to-day, we don't do that. And we need to. We absolutely need to. James 3, verses 7 through 9. For every kind of beast and bird of reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind. You see the dominion and the subduing that man has there, right? But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people. Note the last phrase. Who are made in the likeness of God. Do you know what James is saying? How dare you speak about another human being in a way that defiles the image of God in them. Now, there are a lot of scenarios in life that make working through the dilemmas and the nuances of all of this and one-to-one relationships a little bit challenging. Could I ever discipline somebody? Can I ever say that they're a fool? Yes, those are scenarios we can work through. But by and large, you better be very careful as you think about our tongue, how we speak to and about other human beings who are also made in God's likeness. Next question, how is man or humanity like God? I'm going to jump ahead to chapter 2 very briefly and summarize what we even see in chapter 2 about the ways in which we are like God as humans, okay? So like God, man works and keeps the creation and he also rests. God does that. He works and keeps and he rests. We'll talk more about that later on. Chapter 2, verse 15. Like God, man distinguishes between right and wrong and reasons. We do that like God does. Chapter 2, verses 16 through 17. Like God, man names and orders creation. We like to name things. We like to order things. We like to taxonomize, if you will, categorize things. How many of you have a to-do list going almost all the time? right? You are playing into the image of God beautifully like that. Not that God is a to-do list, but he orders things. He categorizes things. Like God, man speaks and dialogues with others, chapter 2, verse 23. And like God, man recognizes and appreciates beauty, right? Again, we'll look at that when we get to chapter 2. But it is fascinating to understand that Genesis was not written to animals. It was written to human beings. And so even the way God communicates himself reveals that we are like God. We can understand and appreciate something of goodness and even all the full range of what that means in Genesis 1. So that was a bit of review from last week and the last couple of weeks. Let's just jump back into the text, pick it up in verse 28. I'm going to read actually starting in verse, let's start in verse 24 and read through the end of the chapter, okay? And God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds, livestock and creeping things and beasts of the earth according to their kinds, and it was so. And God made the beasts of the earth according to their kinds and livestock according to their kinds and everything that creeps on the ground according to its kind, and God saw that it was good. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth 
subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, behold, I've given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth, every tree with seed in its fruit, you shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth and to every bird of the heavens and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw everything that he had made. And behold, it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. God saw everything that he made. And behold, it was very good. Notice right away in verse 28, we pick it up from there from last week. God blessed them. The them here is referring to humans or mankind. God blessed mankind after he made them, after he created them. Interestingly enough, this is like the animals, what we see back in verse 22. And what does it mean? What does it mean that God blesses man? What does it mean that God blesses even the animals? That God bless them means he not only creates them, but then also enables them to do what he designed and commanded them to do. In broad terms, this is a biblical late motif. This is a minor motif in all of Scripture. You can't do anything completely on your own, right? You need God. You are dependent on God. You don't exist without God's favor. Did you know that? Every beat of your heart, every breath in and breath out is by God's favor to you. The moment he stops his favor on you in that regard, you're done. You're done. And yet we don't think about that often. We don't think that my every single day existence is dependent on the favor of God, right? And yet this should cause us a little bit of tempered sobriety when we think about what does it mean to be a human being living the existence that God has designed for me And yet we get all arrogant and cocky and like, I'm my own man. I've got this. Oh, sure you do, right? You only exist by the favor of God. That's what blessing means here. God enables the human beings, along with the animals, to do what he's designed them to do. He gave them his favor. All of this means that man, like all the animals, still needs God's enabling to accomplish not just what he wants us to do, but what we were created to do. Waltke says this, blessing enables God's creatures to fulfill their natures and to live in their element. Every single day, every single day. So God blessed them, and then notice the next phrase, God said to them. Now, if we were reading this all in one section and working through it all in one sermon, which is kind of tricky, you would notice a subtle yet rather significant change. Instead of God just saying, addressing animals, he actually speaks to the human beings. This is casting something of God's personal nature with mankind. So rather than saying, God just saying, God actually says to the human beings, to Adam and Eve. God says to them, God God says to them in verse, uh, where are we? Verse 28, God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. God has been speaking throughout, right? He's been speaking throughout Genesis 1. That's why I've put in bold each time when God addresses his creation, when God speaks. There is a strong emphasis in Genesis 1 that God is not only a speaking God, but he acts through his speech. God's word is powerful. He is very clearly a talking God. Though he speaks in relation to other created beings, Genesis 1 emphasizes that he uniquely speaks to humans, to man, and in fact, he talks the most in reference to humans. So you notice all of the declarative statements in Genesis 1. The most of them are found, most of them are found in relation to mankind. And he says, be fruitful, multiply. So you see five different commands here under be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, three, then subdue, four, and then have dominion. Five different commands that God is giving to men. And remember, they are commands that are backed by God's blessing, by God's favor. 
God's desire for man is in part reflected in not just the first three commands, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, but in the sequence of the first three. Fruitful could mean a range of different things. If you think about a fruitful Saturday, what would that be like? Well, for some of you, a fruitful Saturday would have been you caught all of the games at March Madness, right? For others, a fruitful Saturday would be you got all of your list accomplished. That's a fruitful Saturday. For others, you would think of fruitfulness in other, in other ways. Fruitfulness here, it's further focused through the next word, multiply. The way humans are fruitful by God's command is they reproduce themselves. And that's further focused on the filling. What is the goal of the be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth? Filling the earth is the goal for men to be fruitful. God wants human beings, at least by Genesis 1 account, he wants human beings to be all over the earth. He wants human beings to populate the earth. And we're going to see fully in chapter 2 what exactly that entails. There's a working and keeping element to all of that, which is embedded in the dominion of man in his multiplying and his filling the earth. So that is the sequence. So you have, he wants man to be fruitful. What does that mean practically? It means for man to multiply himself. And why does God want man to reproduce himself? So that he might fill the earth. Notice this, the second two commands, subduing, and have dominion are, simply two, are not simply two additional commands. They function to some degree as the reason for the first three. Now imagine the world is the way it is in Genesis 1. Size-wise, it's massive. There's a lot of land. There are a lot of animals. And God creates how many human beings at first? Two, Right? God has said, I have created man in my image and a direct consequence of him being like me is that he's going to reign and rule over the earth. Yeah, that's a big job for two people, right? What if it was just two people all the time? How many of you have cats or dogs, right? Or critters in your house? You start adding more and more critters to your house. And what happens? It takes a little bit more and more to try to manage those critters, at least I think it does, usually. If you're a farmer and you have some cows or you have some pigs, I know ca- farmers don't call them pigs, but you have cows or pigs or you have sheep, what happens when you add more? It takes that much more to manage them. You need a hired hand or you need children or you need somebody to do the work to help manage these things. That is God's goal with humanity in Genesis 1. Man is created in the likeness of God consequentially, to provide dominion and subduing to the rest of the world. How can that happen by just two people? It doesn't. So man says, get to work, have kids, raise them, and they also can be good gardeners. They can be good managers of the world. This is a sidebar, right? I still believe that Genesis 1 foundationally is still apropos today. We're going to talk more about that when we get into chapter two. But this is the sidebar. Every mom and dad, if God blesses you with kids, you should keep this in mind. What is God's desire for my kids? Not firstly, what is my desire for my kids? What does God have for them as image bearers? Does he not also want them to be good domain dwellers, to know how to provide good dominion for those things that God has given to them, right? That's just a brief sidebar. We could take that a long ways down the road, but we're going to pause right there. So we think about God's desire for mankind, and further he says beyond that, behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of the earth and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. Again, think about this. God bless them. They don't exist without God's favor, but even beyond that, they don't exist without God providing for them. We need God, right? We need what God gives to us. It is an astonishing thing, if you stop and think about it, how weak you and I are that we need food. We don't think of it in terms of weakness, but it is. 
We are not self-sufficient. We aren't. Men like food, at least most of us do, right? We don't think of food as a weakness, but as a strength. Look at how much I can put down. Yeah, look at how much you need God, really, is another way to put it. And then think about how hard it is to back off of food. Look at how much you still need God for self-discipline, right? God provides for his creation. He says, all of the plant yielding seed, every tree with seed in its fruit, you shall have them for food. Scripture in Genesis 1 does not say at this time that meat was prohibited, but by implication, even taking into account Genesis 9, it appears that the first humans, Adam and Eve, didn't eat meat. Now hold that thought because we will get to Genesis 9, all right? That brings a whole different change into the works. But God provided what man needed to keep going through the plant life, right? He moves on, and to every beast of the earth, to every bird of the heavens, to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that is the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. The animals need God's provision. Everything that lives needs God's provision every single day. There is good reason, not just because it blesses the food, which what does that mean? There is good reason to pray before you eat to thank God for his provision right? To thank him for what he has provided. God has to provide for all of his creation, both humans and animals. And notice what we read, and it was so. And God saw that everything he had made, and behold, it was very good. Now, when the Old Testament uses the word behold, it is a marker usually to say, pay attention to what's coming next. This is rather significant, So when God says, behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed, he's saying, take notice, I am providing what you need to live. And now near the end of this chapter, God says, behold, it was very good. Take note, God's valuation of his creation, not just a part, but the whole thing and all the parts is that it's not just good, but it's very good. It is very good. And there was evening and morning the sixth day. So what does it mean that everything is very good? Let's work through this very briefly right now. The basic definition of the word for good in the Old Testament means pleasant or agreeable. Or how do you like this? Good. That's what it means, right? How it's used in Genesis, chapter 2, verse 9, good for food. What does that mean? Well, it is agreeable for food. It works well for food. It's okay for food. It were, it's, it's doing what it was designed to do. What about later in verse 9? The knowledge of good and evil. So good in that case is compared or contrasted to evil. So good in this way is moral goodness. So good is used in a multitude of different ways in the book of Genesis. What about chapter 2 verse 12? The gold is good in that land. The gold, good gold. What's good gold? It's valuable, it's precious, it's pure, right? It's really good gold. It's better than gold elsewhere, right? Chapter 6, verse 2, the daughters of men were attractive. Attractive there is our same word good. So good can be used to refer to beauty. What is physically pleasant to the eyes, right? Chapter 15, verse 15, a good old age. What does that mean? Well, he lived a long life and a life that was like, yeah, that was good, right? It's kind of hard to use synonyms for this, isn't it? Chapter 16, verse 6, here's another use of good, do as you please. In that case, it was not a good do as you please, but still this is do as what pleases you or in its basic term, do what you want to do, right? So this is the range of good as used in Genesis. It's used in Genesis 1 seven times, interestingly enough. The word good is used. I think it conveys a sense of completeness. God himself evaluates everything he made as good. So we could see, we could say that he's using good in this way. It's right, it's fitting, it's pleasant, it's delightful. It is the way it should be. It is perfect. It's good. 
To affirm that creation is good then is to affirm that God takes delight in it and that man at his best will do so as well. I like that statement. So what does this include? It includes that God has made what he has made is very good. The very fact that he made, right? Further, what God has made is very good, right? Third, how God has made what he has made is very good. Right? You think of even kids building creations either with Lego or modeling clay or something, and, or they're drawing a picture on a page. And, and when they're first trying to, to express their creative juices, so to speak, they, they turn to you as dad and they say, Dad, look what I've made. And most dads are like, that's sweet, that's precious, you know, good job, good job. But really, is it a good job? You ever seen those pictures that are trying to capture if animals looked the way kids drew them, what would it look like? (laughs) Have you seen those memes before? I have. And you look at those pictures and it's like, oh my. If it actually looked like that, I would be terrified out of my gore to see that. Is that a cow? Is it a giraffe? Or is it a platypus? I don't know. If I saw that in my front yard, I would probably, well, I would probably do something that's inappropriate, right? But as you think about goodness, the way God made things is just right. It's not like that. Like, who would look at that and say, oh, go back home? No. What about further the relationship of all that he has made, both in reference to him and in reference to each part was very good. It was perfect. It was well-fitting. Paul says this in 1 Timothy 4, verse 4, for everything created by God is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving, for it is made holy by the word of God in prayer. In that case, you know what he's talking about? He's talking about marriage. He's talking about food. Food and marriage are two things that God created as very good, right? They are good. They are as they ought to be. As it relates to us, think about this very carefully, especially in light of where our current cultural climate is. God creating humans is very good. God creating humans as uniquely unique among all his creation is very good. God creating humans uniquely to relate to him is very good. God creating humans uniquely over all the other creatures is very good. God creating humans as male and female is very good. God creating humans and entrusting them with his word is very good. God creating humans and telling us that it is also very good is very good for us. Meaning this, why do you think God tells us seven times in Genesis 1 that his valuation of creation is good? Do you want to know why? Because we are goodness barometers. We know goodness. Now, Genesis 3 forward, all of that gets strangely distorted. But mankind was designed by God to acknowledge goodness and to appreciate goodness. Another sidebar, we'll put it over here this time. As those who are still made in God's image, you ought to love God's creation. You ought to grow in your appreciation for the embedded beauty God has in his created world. Doesn't mean you have to love Ranger Rick like I did when I was a kid, but it does mean you should push yourself to appreciate created beauty. You don't worship the creation, but you let the creation draw your attention to see the majesty and the wonder of the creator. Every single time, you learn more and more about God's creation, it should compel you to say, wow, this is so cool, God, that you have made this. And even thousands of years later, distorted as it is by the fall, it is still phenomenal. It is so cool. Whether it's a sunset or a sunrise or the majesty and the power of the ocean or the mountains, it is so cool. Or you think even about a storm that you can see coming in. Anybody ever love watching storms come in? And you see it, and there's something again about that, I am so puny and small, yet how can I stop looking at this? Or you see a tornado starting to form. It's like, whoa, this is so cool and scary at the same time. Appreciate God's creation. 
all of creation, being and doing as God designed it, is not a cursed existence at all. Keep that in mind. Being and doing what God designed you to be and do is not somehow a demotion. It's actually experiencing the favor of God. Further, to flip it kind of around, any distortion then of God's very good design is not in fact good. No matter what you think or feel, it's not good. Your definition of goodness must be in line with God's definition of goodness. And this is again where Genesis 3 just turns everything on its head. We evaluate things as good when actually it's wrong. And we flip it around again. So what does Genesis 1 mean for me? What does it mean for you? Here's kind of a list of things to think about. Not an exhaustive list, but ways to kind of think about Genesis 1. I am a something. How do you like that statement? Can you say that? Let's say it together. I am a something. Praise the Lord, you're a something. I know that sounds really weird to put it like that, but you talk to a range of even brains out there in the world. Do they have a definition for you as being a something? Uh, Sometimes it's lacking. God says that you're a something, but even more than a something, I am specifically created by God. Again, Genesis 3, change things up a little bit. But you look at Psalm 39 as just another example. The psalmist says, I am fearfully and wonderfully made by God himself. God is still very much involved in the creation of human beings inside the womb. He is the one who molds and fits us together. I am a living creature created with intentional design, definition, and distinction. Right? This is who you are based upon Genesis 1. I am not everlasting, but I am eternal. I have not always been, but from this point forward, I always will be in some capacity. Again, we don't have clarity on what that means just yet, but that is who God has made me to be. Further, I am, I am a human made in the image and likeness of God. I reflect him. I'm connected to him, I am made in reference to him. Further, I am created by God as either a male human or a female human. That is who God has made me to be. I am a person with personhood and personality. I am further entrusted with God's instructions and commands. He gives to mankind his word. He says to mankind, you are to do this and I expect you to do this. We are entrusted with his word. I am responsible to be who he's created me to be, where he has placed me. I am dependent upon God for being who he's created me to be. I am created in relationship to him, other humans, and all other living creatures. And lastly, I am created to be a part of his very good creation as he's created me to be. I hesitated in how I put that because I wanted to say, I am good. I like to qualify everything, and that statement really needs a whole lot of qualification because Jesus even qualifies it in the Gospels. No man is good but God himself. When is he saying that in creation history, in the timeline of human history, after man has fallen? But taking what God says in Genesis 1, the very fact that he's made me a human and who I am as male, I am a part of his good creation. Genesis 1 forms the foundation of the right view of self. You are not garbage. You are not a mixture of cells that just happen to randomly get together one night. That is not who you are. You are not a mistake. Even if you're the product of people who didn't know what they were doing, you are not a mistake. You are created as a human in the image of God, and it was by his design that you exist. Does that matter? Absolutely it matters, right? These are the sorts of things that if people could just listen, they need to hear. You need to be a believer in Jesus Christ who is solid on these truths so you cannot win an argument, no, so that you can provide hope. 
This is reality, folks. This is real reality. You're living in a dream world, and it's hopeless despair. That's where it's headed. But God's word is so beautifully true. Sometimes it's hard, but it's beautifully true. So let me just put it this way. I'm going to list a bunch of isms here, okay? And I will be misunderstood probably on one or two of the isms. As an ism, this means that this is a ideology, okay? So you can see on there I have uh, industrialism. I am not against industry, okay? But I am against an industrialism, and that is an ideology which I'll get there in a moment. So if Genesis 1 is true, if everything that we have just covered is true, then nihilism or nihilism is wrong. Now, in very brief form, nihilism says, there's no meaning. Genesis 1 just blows it out of the water. Oh, all of creation is full of meaning because God made it. So nihilism, nihilism is wrong. Further, humanism is wrong. Now, some people use these words differently. I get that. But broadly speaking, I'm thinking of humanism as humans don't need God. Humanism says humans have reached the pinnacle. We're at the top of our game. We're at the top of everyone's game. It's all about humans. Well, it's not actually. It's all about God, right? So a secular humanism is completely wrong. Third, evolutionism is wrong. Evolutionism says we've just evolved from animals. We're just the next stage in the development of all living critters. No, we're not. Number four, racism is wrong right? Can you say that too? Racism is wrong. Racism as an ism basically says, if you're ethnically different from me, you're inferior, right? We all have different shades of either peach or brown in this room, right? Depending upon if that's the way you were born or if you went to Florida or somewhere else recently, right? We all have different shades, but we're all humans. There is no inferiority based upon your ethnic background, period, right? There is no inferiority. Further, sexism is wrong. Can you say that too? Sexism as an ism says, if you're not my gender, you're inferior, right? Be careful. Sexism can be bred in the junior high heart too, right? It really can. Be careful. Be careful, be careful, be careful, be careful. Further, further, egalitarianism is wrong. Egalitarianism, as an ism, says, if you're not my gender, that's no problem. We're all the same. That's what egalitarianism says. We may reproduce differently or function differently in reproduction, but functionally, we're all doing the same stuff. That's not right. That's wrong. God made males to be males, not just in reproduction. God made females to be females and not just in reproduction. Okay, we'll talk about more of that in chapter two of, of Genesis. Environmentalism is wrong. I love the environment. I love creation. But the notion behind environmentalism as an ism is wrong, meaning we must protect the environment at any cost. I'm sorry, no, not at any cost, okay? Further, industrialism as an ism is wrong, which says we must make progress at any cost. I'm sorry, no, that's wrong too. Further, individualism is wrong. Individualism in a word or a phrase is, I am the master of my fate. Well, you do have a choice to make, but you are not the master of your fate. Right now, we're living in a time of the triumph of the individual, right? Further, collectivism is wrong. Collectivism as an ism is, the group is always right. No, the group is not always right. One good reason why the church is not technically a democracy, right? Further, fatalism is wrong. Fatalism says, what's the use? It's all not worth it anyway. And then lastly, indeterminism is wrong. As an ism, it is saying that everything is subject to chance. There is no real chance when it comes to understanding the God of the universe. Now, from our perspective, some things seems like, wow, that just happened, like the roll of the dice. But guess what? The God of the universe is in control of all things, even the roll of the dice. 
That's what Proverbs says. I trust that you will be greatly shored up as you think about the foundation of what it means to live as a human being made in the image of God. And we, this is only chapter one. We've got chapter two to cover too, and that's coming. God, thank you so much for your goodness to us. Thank you for your word. I do pray, Lord, that your word would be precious to us, that we would take delight in it, but not simply as something we take delight in. I pray that we would know it, that we would understand it, that we would regularly make use of it to form the way we think, the way we see, and the way we act. And may you be glorified in all of the doing. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand once again as we close our time together. Oh, great God of highest heaven, occupy my lowly heart. Own it all and reign supreme, conquer every rebel power. Let no vice or sin remain that resists your holy war. You have loved and purchased me. Make me yours forevermore. I was blinded by my sin, had no ears to hear your did not know your love within, had no taste for heaven's joys. Then your spirit gave me light, opened up your word to me. Through the gospel of your Son, came the endless hope and peace. Second Sunday, here we are. Isn't this great? It's fantastic. Over the next couple of weeks, we do have some special opportunities together that will be included even on Wednesday nights, uh, including a time when we help kind of cast an understanding of how to make use of this place well and care for it well. But just before then, just as a reminder, parents, please keep an eye on your kids. Don't let them out of your sight. Keep them off of the platform in this, these fantastic jungle gym bars over here, okay? There actually aren't jungle gym bars, so don't have them on there. And then at the same time, uh, they can't just play hide and seek, and, and therefore you don't know where they are, okay? That's kind of what hide and seek is all about. You don't know where people are. So keep an eye on your kids, and we'll have more to say about that in a couple of weeks. But thanks so much. God bless you. You are dismissed. <laughs>